welcome to the Art of Listening to Your Body podcast. My name is Jin Ong and I'm your host. I love talking about the mind-body connection and how your physical body manifests your emotional state and how this leads to living a life grounded in values and driven by purpose. Welcome to today's podcast. Today we have Gavin Lang, who is my first podcast guest, sharing his pain story. Gavin Lang is a mountain guide and photographer based in Wanaka, New Zealand. He guides his clients on mountains in NZ as well as South America. He is also working on a new project, climbing the 24 3,000 metre peaks across New Zealand while shooting photos and videos. His aim is to write a book, create a photo book of his adventures, as well as a documentary. For Gavin, mountaineering is more about the journey of self-development and awareness, and this is something he loves to facilitate with his clients. He's also my husband, and we have a five-year-old daughter, Violet, born at home by Lotus Birth. Gavin has had a number of injuries over the years, and his goal was to have an injury-free year, and he's been able to maintain this now for the last six years. So welcome, Gavin. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Thanks for having me. Great. So let's get into it. Can you tell me about your life now? Well, life is very different at the moment. I'm currently homeschooling. I'm not doing any mountaineering. I'm dreaming about the mountains. I'm uh, rendering photos and video I've taken over the last six months, six or seven months, uh, whenever I can. I'm running a nightly radio show, um, really just for friends and family as a bit of a music therapy outlet, I suppose. And um, many days can seem the same. Uh, or similar, but um, I'm enjoying the novelty of the uh, the different set of circumstances we're in right now. Cool. And can you tell me a little bit about how you got into mountaineering or being a mountain guide? I started caving when I was in Belgium, when I lived in Belgium, and that developed into uh, an, a real interest in climbing mountains to get into the caves. I was able to uh, explore that curiosity more when I came to New Zealand for the first time in 2000. I came back to live here permanently in 2004, uh, took a course in outdoor recreation leadership, and that really springboarded my life in uh, mountain guiding. So since 2004, I guided on the Franz Joseph Glacier, followed shortly by 2007, uh, becoming a, a, uh, the first level certification mountain guide and then completing the um, climbing guide certification in 2012. So how did I get into it? Um, Just a real curiosity for what it was like to be up in the mountains. I liked the look of it and I seemed to be attracted to it and I seemed to take to it naturally. So I just followed something that felt very natural to me. Cool. Now some people will be wondering where your accent is from. So can you tell people where you're actually from and why you've got the accent you do? Well, the funny accent is uh, part of the first 17 years I spent in Dublin, where I grew up. And then at 17, I left to uh, to live in Belgium to be a, a drummer in a rock band. So I spent four years over there speaking broken English. And that changed after about two years, I, I, I started speaking Dutch. And uh, sometimes I question the way I um, uh, form a sentence. It might be the way they would form it in Dutch. So some very um, formative years were spent in Belgium. And so maybe that explains why the uh, funny accent. And of course, it's been watered down by living in New Zealand for the last 15 or more years. Mm-hmm. Cool. And can you just differentiate what you do as a mountain guide because I know a lot of people ask you how's the trekking going so well mountain guiding in 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 terms of what I do is taking people onto the glaciers or higher up into the mountain the highest mountain huts in New Zealand um it's not necessarily trekking over passes it's it's actually putting on crampons using ice axes ropes technical equipment um to climb sometimes the steeper routes on the steeper, more challenging routes on the mountain. Um, so it's not just trekking with a, a backpack and uh, sturdy tramping shoes and, and a billy. Um, it, it often involves the technical uh, equipment 
um, as well, up on the glaciers and up on snow and ice. Great. Okay. And what does being a mountain guide mean to you? Because you've changed a lot over the years in how you approach it. So what is the process that you facilitate with your clients? Well, the motivations changed for me after my major injury, which we'll probably talk about later. Um, and it was a slow realization of, of the power of um, the connection with nature, um, the challenges that were faced. So the power of nature and adventure on our mental health and the positive effects of it. Um, as I started to see how important that was, I, I started to study it and investigate it more. And I incorporated that more and more into my courses. As well as that, along the way, I, I studied psychosomatic therapy and emotional anatomy and began to realize the, the importance, the universality of, of these um, skills and how, well, everybody, when they're coming on a mountain trip is striving for something better. And we, we often allude as mountain guides um, to being a kind of counselor, facilitator, psychologist, albeit amateur. Uh, we often allude to that, but we don't necessarily really try to facilitate it uh, properly or full on. And so it's, this is my attempt to do that properly and uh, give it more attention. And I, I guess now I've built it up enough that I've become known for that. So you come on a trip with me, you'll get so much more than just being guided to the top of a mountain. Mm, Cause it's more about the journey, isn't it? Absolutely. So it, uh, it, it's often said, it's not about getting to the summit. It's about that journey. And that that's very true. And, and there is so much to be learned from disappointment or, um, you know, how you rise up from a failure, a perceived failure, and that there's opportunity in every single moment or every single thing like that, where um, we find it difficult, we find it hard, we find it uncomfortable. There's so much of that challenge in, in the mountain environment. And we get a chance to, um, every day on my, on my courses, or specifically this course that I run called Self Mastery Through Mountaineering, we get a chance to debrief that every day, to pick it apart, to deep dive into what has gone on and unravel some frustrations or anger or shame, guilt, whatever it is that shows up. Um, and it's often very liberating for my clients. So uh, it's a great environment um, to do that. And often my trips are between five and seven days long, some are longer. We get an unhurried opportunity to do that properly mm. and what is interesting is that we've both studied psychosomatic therapy within quite a short period of one another but we both facilitate it in a very different way and in a way that resonates with us what would you say to someone who wants to get into mountaineering because I think it can be so out of reach for so many people financially but also it's so in the unknown um, you know, people often think I'm not fit enough. I'm not good enough. I've got fears of heights. What would you say to someone who is thinking about climbing a mountain and doesn't know where to start? Well, it's a lot of different things. How do you eat an elephant one small bite at a time? Um, if you recognize that you've got some fears around heights or whatever it may be, uh, uh, learning to manage those can be the most liberating aspect of this. So don't worry too much about being good at mountaineering, but uh, facing that fear is something. It, if you bring awareness to that, that you're trying to um, overcome some fear, if you take small steps, you'll be able to see yourself gradually getting better or more comfortable with um, that issue you have. And it, I mean, I use myself as, as an example. Two of my biggest fears, claustrophobia and fear of heights. And I, my first real passion for uh, an outdoor pursuit was caving. And my second is mountaineering. Mountaineering, I don't really cave anymore um, because I guess I overcame that fear. Um, 
but mountaineering is now number one. And uh, I, I, I still I still have a fear of heights. I, I think it's in all of us. Uh, so it's really just about managing that fear. Um, so small steps, uh, write yourself out a, a plan and uh, what that looks like. You won't all of a sudden be invited on some really hard mountain trip by an experienced climber without having tried something yourself. So if you've got a good level of fitness through your tramping or biking, whatever it is, then uh, you're likely to be able to enjoy the experience more. Um, because if you haven't worked on your fitness, then it will, will be another issue when you get out there and it will be painful and uncomfortable. So work on your fitness, work on tramping and work baby steps towards the ultimate goal. Cool. And for those of you who don't know what tramping is, it's a Kiwi term for hiking. All right. Are you ready to get into your pain story? Yeah, let's go cool. for it. Okay. So you've had a number of injuries in your lifetime. Some of them you've been more aware of what triggered them than others, and you've had times to reflect. So how long ago did you experience your most significant injury? Well, the most significant one ever was in 2009, so 11 years ago. Um, prior to that, I had some knee injuries. And after that, I've had a shoulder injury. So um, I've had both knees 10 years apart, shoulder and neck injury. They, they've been the most significant. Mm, okay. So we're going to go into your neck injury. Can you give me a little bit more detail about that and for our listeners? So the, the cervical spine, um, I herniated three different discs in, in my neck and um, it was through uh, a combination of things not taking any time to rest so there is a saying that if you find a job you love uh, you'll never work a day in your life and and that's when I started mountain guiding that's what I had found I had this autonomy to go into the mountains with clients and really be creative with what what we would do during that week and bring out the best in my clients and I never really took breaks. And if I had breaks, one or two days off in between trips, I would fill them with other activities. So although I felt fine, I overdid it. And that was where the resulting injury came from. Now the injury took uh, six or seven months to figure out because it presented as a, as a, sh a shoulder, mild neck pain, but made more significant shoulder pain or discomfort. Um, and as it progressed, it, it became something else more sort of like, uh, um, shooting pain or tingling down my arm, right up into my finger. And, uh, it took six or, six or seven months to say, well, let's have a closer look and get an MRI scan. Um, so that was the most significant injury. Mm -hmm. um, For those of you who aren't too sure what a disc herniation is, Throughout your spine, you have bony vertebrae, and in between each of those segments, you have what's called a disc, and that acts as a shock absorber. And sometimes due to posture, load, or physical activity, we put more strain through certain joints, and the body has an amazing and the body has an amazing capability to compensate until it can't anymore. And this is sometimes where a disc will tear on the outer layers, and the inner disc will bulge out the jelly material and this can happen to varying degrees so from what Gavin's explaining he may have had a minor disc irritation with the shoulder and the neck discomfort but then as it opened up a little bit more or got more inflamed it then started to impinge on his nerve that traveled down his arm so that's when he started to get some neurological issues so apart from getting the tingling and shooting pains down your hand what else did you experience after a number of months, I and, and after trying a few different things to uh, relieve the pain, I noticed a sudden um, atrophy of muscles on the right hand side on the, on the upper body. So a whole bunch of muscle wasted away. And uh, then I knew something more sinister was up. The pain was constant and low level. I call it a three or four out of 10. Uh, at its worst, but it was constant. And I would wake up in the morning and go, oh, this thing again. So it, it got me to my lowest point ever. Um, apart from the tingling and the atrophy, um, 
it it I I'd lost strength in the in the right arm. Um, I could see the bones through my pecs, and uh, I could feel them. So the the, uh, the 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 tone of those muscles had completely wasted away, and I'd lost eight or nine kilos. So all of a sudden, in the space of maybe three or four weeks, uh, during that period, I'd lost eight or nine kilos. Mm-hmm. So I knew something was up, and that's when I, I, if I remember correctly, that was roughly around the time I got a uh, got an MRI, or I ordered an MRI, I booked an MRI. Mm. And I've noticed with a lot of my disc patients is that it's probably one of the most emotionally taxing conditions because it seems like it can just really wear you down with that constant discomfort. And then a lot of fears can come up around your ability to perform, your ability to work and therefore support yourself as well. And yours was on your right side. So you'll often hear me talk about the left versus the right side and or feminine versus masculine. And the right side has a lot to do with the energy of doing all the time being physical, being processed, being analytical. And Gavin was alluding to just going all the time and not having the rest breaks. And this is where the body can sometimes say, look, you're pushing too hard. I'm going to give you some signs and um, it can really stop you in your tracks, which is what can happen with disc injuries. But they can appear in all sorts of um, different fashions, different symptoms. They don't all have to cause neurological discomfort. And what I like to teach people is listen to the signs that your body is giving you earlier. So, yeah, what was your experience in reaching a diagnosis? You saw some practitioners. When you're in pain, it can be difficult to make decisions. So you talk about getting to your lowest point. Mm. What happened for you mentally? Uh, well, mentally, um, it, it was obvious that um, I was going nowhere fast. There was a lot of uncertainty around my future, whether I could uh, guide or even climb for that matter. I was, wasn't was really given much clarity on whether a, an operation would be a good idea or not. Uh, I saw two specialists. One of them was sort of shrugged his shoulders and said, well, you can either operate or, or you can't. And I didn't have many other examples around or, or, or any for that matter of people who uh, were in the same boat as me and had a good result or a bad result or operation no operation so I didn't have a lot to go on and there was this underlying feeling of okay I need to go deep inside and figure out what's going on um I started to feel quite lonely because uh the the I'd built up this I I, uh personality ID ego whatever whatever way you want to describe it of someone who was active, constantly on the go, always energetic, and that was crumbling away. So my ego was starting to die. And I can't, there was no exact moment where this happened, but it was about understanding that I hadn't, I didn't have balance in my life. And so partially through finding out that it's a disc injury and partially through finding out a bit more about myself by digging in deep, going in deep and, and just eventually surrendering to what was i started to find some respite the the pain started to subside so it really was uh, a case of mind over matter um i couldn't force myself to have less pain it was when i surrendered to the pain and i accepted that i may never guide ever again i may never be able to climb um uh, as well as I as I had, or even at all, when I gave into that situation, the surrender was the key. And so it's a very it's a it's a tricky thing to describe surrender, but hopefully that gets the message across that I I gave into what was, just like in this situation of uh, being stuck at home and locked down for twenty eight days, giving into the situation is not saying, oh well, just knock me over, I'll do nothing, and I'll lie on the couch for the rest of my life. It's, it's not about that. It's about oh, bringing awareness to something that's out of your control and accepting it. Mm. Very hard thing to do. Very easy to explain and, and put it very simply like give into it, surrender to what is. Yeah, right, but I'm in pain right now and I want to get over that. 
and it, it, um, it's, it's, it's easier said than done. But experiencing it for months and months and months and seeing no change meant that was my only alternative. So that's how I saw some change. Mm. How did you manage to get out of pain? Um, well, it was, there was no silver bullet. There was no one thing, but it was, it was a combination of different things. The most significant things that helped me were uh, seeing certain specialists who took a more holistic approach. And I didn't know you at this time, um, but the, the, believe it or not, one of them was in Buenos Aires, um, a highly recommended specialist. Kinesiologist. Uh, kinesiologist. A com- he was a combination of um, uh, disciplines and uh, he took a very um, holistic approach. So Tell me more about that. I want to hear about it. Well, I had a neck injury, but he didn't. He started at my toes and he went up and down the whole body and he found tightness in so many areas and uh um and it most of it was on the right hand side um he that there were two occasions when i walked away floating from either reduced pain or no pain and one of them was after seeing this guy um luis in in buenos aires and i went to see him again about six months later um i remember him I, I, I was in tears after leaving the, his clinic. Uh, it was very hard to get in to see him, by the way. Uh, I was in, in tears after leaving the clinic because I was so elated having this pain removed for, it lasted about a day and a half. Um, but also in the uh, therapy session, he, he, worked on, <laughs> he worked on my jaw and um, uh, that, that biting down on the, on the finger kind of thing just, it, it relieved a lot of pain and I remember that brought tears to my eyes. So two different ways of bringing tears to my eyes for different reasons and different emotions came up, of course, but uh, that was huge relief. Mm. The other big relief was one-on-one yoga. So I highly recommend if you can find a, a very experienced yoga teacher and get their attention one-on-one, they will help you unlock your body. Um, you find the right person who understands the anatomy and, and understands that deeper holistic um, process. So two people that really helped me through that process. Mm. And did you seek any other therapy that didn't work so well for you? Yeah, I tried acupuncture and what else? Chiropractor, um, both of which kind of aggravated it. And, you know, I've since had both um, Western me- medical acupuncture and 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 uh, um, chi- uh, chiropractor treatments, and they've helped me for other things. But at that time, it was obvious to me that either my pain was too severe, and uh, they didn't understand the issue quite so as well, um, or it was just the wrong time, wrong place, and um, and it didn't work for me. Mm. And I think sometimes it can be that your body just isn't in the right space or your mind isn't in the right space to experience the releases that you can sometimes get from treatment. Um, it was Chinese medicine acupuncture though that you had. Yeah. And that's why I say it, there was no silver bullet. It, it was also my participation that, that helped the process when I was open to the change that also helped. So I remember feeling quite low when I went to the acupuncturist and, um, she suggested I do four sessions and I said, okay, well, let's see it through. Um, but I, I guess on it, on reflection, I was expecting to see some change that they would bring about as opposed to me. I was saying, yeah, fix me. And, uh, and then further down the track when I was ready to make change for myself and understand myself better and, uh, accept some of these things that I couldn't change, then, then, it worked together. The right facilitator mm. was was there to help me along the way, and realised I was I was trying to uh, heal myself holistically as well. I remember saying over and over and over at the time, I want I want to do everything I can to not have an operation. Mm. That was my goal at that time. Yeah, and what do you believe on reflection now actually triggered this issue? Uh, well, that's, it's a hard one to pinpoint. 
But if we look at all the parts of the puzzle, my life at that time was very uh, masculine orientated. And if even if you don't believe that, well, just look at what was happening. Every All the injuries were happening on the right side. The knee injury, the neck injury, they, they were both on the right-hand side. So I was, I was leading with this very logical brain, uh, physical side of, of my body. Um, and there wasn't balance. Quite simply, there wasn't balance in my life. I had an intuitive part of my brain or my being that wanted to express itself and it wasn't expressing itself. I had all these ideas about, you know, this kind of stuff that I'm, I'm, I'm doing very freely now, me understanding the psychosomatic therapy or emotional anatomy, doing that now. And that's my number one goal to understand that. That's the kind of stuff I read. That's the kind of stuff I watch. Um, I don't read fiction books quite so much. Um, unless it's a really good moral story. So the I issue at the time was my life wasn't balanced. It was all driven by being active. And um, that's when something gave way. What changes have you made then? Well, to find balance in my life. So the not to keep my foot on the accelerator or the brake, you know, if it's on the accelerator, if it's on, it's, at that time, it was like it was on one or the other, the accelerator or the brake, and both were just grinding down the engine. Um, I've found balance, and I guess I'm a little bit gun shy now, so I tend to keep some in reserve, something that teachers were saying to me when I was a kid, when I was seven years old, just keep some gas in the tank. Don't spend it all, um, and, and don't deplete yourself. So I physically present like someone who's using up all their energy. I don't have any reserves. I'm kind of thin and wary. What changes did you make to your work? Oh, because you the... talked about you weren't expressing yourself as much. Yeah, very uh, great question. Because that was the key to me making sure that my life as a mountaineer was uh, the most rewarding, most fulfilling for both me and my clients moving forward. And so making the changes and the, and the steps towards um, turning mountain guiding around to be about facilitating people's self-development or, or growth or uh, self-mastery, understanding, whatever it is, and uh, exploring wilderness therapy, exploring adventure therapy, exploring all these other modalities and incorporating them into one package that I would be best able to serve the community or those who were, were interested in, in coming on a mountaineering trip. I was noticing that people wanted something more. The people that were showing up wanted more than just to get to the summit. They wanted to explore these avenues. And when I started, uh, when I finally made that happen in 2016, um, it, was, uh, it was amazing how many people showed up to do that. And those that didn't, show up to do that that were still coming in to do the ascent i would i would explore with them i would test them i would i would test the waters and see if they were interested and uh, quite often they were so by the by the time i went into the second summer or the second season of this kind of guiding um it went from maybe 50 percent of my clients being interested in that to 80 percent and and now it's 95 percent of my clients show up for both the mountaineering element and the self-development, self-mastery. Mm, so you're working with your ideal client. Absolutely. So I, I put it out there. I, I took a chance. It was very scary. Uh, it, I didn't know if it would succeed. But you remember me saying, I have to try this. Mm. I could easily retire from guiding right now. And by right now, I mean 2014, 2015. Around mm. the time we had, we had Violet, I said, I'm not sure if I will go back to guiding for these reasons. But I realized that it, it was the thing I was a so-called expert in and it would probably be the best business uh, I could set up at mm. that point in time. And it was a, 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 an itch I needed to scratch. I needed to see if, the, if, if not the market necessarily, but just people in general were interested in this sort of stuff. Yeah. And they were. They showed up. Yes. Those that aren't interested just stayed away. I know there's plenty of people yeah. are not interested. And yeah. they stay away. That's, yeah. That's okay. That's what I love. And I'm just going to go a little bit more into the emotional interpretation about 
your neck because I talked about it being on the right side. But the neck lies between our heart, which is the chest area, and our throat chakra, which is around the neck. And often there can be this conflict between what the heart desires and what your mind wants. So the junction, the area that Gav had his injury was between the, that bend between the top of your shoulder and your neck. And so it can be this disconnect between what your heart wants, what your mind wants. And being in the neck area, this is all about communicating, verbalizing your that deep sense of identity and how you want to express yourself, how you want to show up to the world. And what I really love about this work is that your body is always telling you when you're not aligned with what you really want. And it can give us some pretty strong signs. And yeah, it sounds like through Gav's process of surrender and looking within as hard as it was because you saw some psychologists as well during this period of time yeah, didn't you yeah a lot yeah. of different people yeah yeah is um then getting back in line of what do I really want and then starting to express that and we've got similar stories where we were both working in our respective professions me as an osteopath and Gavin as a mountain guide and it wasn't that we needed to let go of that we just needed to reinvent and we needed to express ourselves in our profession in a different way that felt right to us and yeah it's you know the ego does get affected because you want to be liked by everybody and that fear of rejection but we moved back to Wanaka in 2016 with hardly any money and a almost two-year-old but we just knew deep down inside that we both had to do our own thing and everything really did just flow from there. Mm. We attracted the, t- the right people and therefore, yeah, more fulfilled with our work and valued for the work that we do. How long did your neck injury take to recover? Because that's a big thing with discs. For me, I feel like they take quite a while. It can take a couple of years. It doesn't mean you need to be in pain for a couple of years. Mm. But it is a long game. Hard to put a, an exact figure on it, but expect at least a year and you will see some results, some good positive results. As long as you understand first what's actually going on. And get the right support. And get the right support. But eight, eight, 18 months is probably more realistic. And mm. then the numbness that I had in my index finger right down my right arm had tingling and then right into my um, index finger I had a little bit of numbness on the pad i don't remember exactly when that came back but it might have been three years mm. so that regrowth the neurological pathways is very slow mm. and uh, it might have been three or even more years since and i still feel it on the back of my hand from time to time tingling mm. i have had crashes kite skiing and various different things don't remember biking but just landing badly doing something in the park or whatever mm. on a playground and uh landing back and having this not a relapse but a sensation of oh whoops i've just done something really bad to my neck mm-hmm. and thankfully it hasn't been any more sinister mm, but listening to it this time as well listening and stopping yeah and actually you went to a vipassana meditation during your neck injury is that right i did yeah Yes. So so that, well, the first, the seed was sown uh, some years prior uh, when I did my first Vipassana course, it was 2002. And then 2009, I'd I'd been talking about doing another one for years. And because I was injured and I, I I wasn't able to guide, I found some space to do a Vipassana course. And it was the hardest thing ever, sitting still and observing sensations on the body. And the first four days were absolute hell. And um, and many people say that Vipassana course is absolute hell, even without an injury or pain. For people who don't know what Vipassana meditation is, can you give them a quick overview? Sure. It's a 10-day silent meditation retreat. It's, um, it's, it's a meditation course in the tradition of uh, the Buddha. Um, it's not Buddhism. Um, There are just techniques for focusing either on the breath or sensations in the body, observing them as they are. And, and that, and that's it really, you are facilitated and reminded over and over and over again about these simple techniques and that's it. 
but um and to not react and to not react you just observe them as they are you don't crave pleasant sensations and you don't avert the unpleasant sensations mm. and that is wraps it up in a nutshell mm. um you're you're sitting down for an hour at a time and all your meals are catered for you do you don't have to do anything you just need to brush your teeth and have it have a shower and even then you don't have to shower if you don't want to mm. um <laughs> it's very simple it's it's living the life of a monk for one of a better description it's a very simple process it's one of the hardest and simplest things for people to do there's a lot of resistance around it absolutely four days in was when i surrendered and in the morning of day four, I wanted to leave. I wanted to run away. I wanted to get out of there because I had so much pain. And something changed in the afternoon. I gave in to what was. I said, okay, we're going to go back into this thing. I'm going to give it 100% for one more hour, 100%. And that was when everything changed. Mm. And I had, you know, some pleasant sensations. For a moment, the pain went away. But therein lay the, the trap. Um, I felt like I had gotten over this crux. I'd gotten through my day four, but I'd also said, oh, it would be nice to have some more of that pleasant sensation tomorrow. <laughs> and therein was the learning, the next step of my learning. So the that's craving. That, the craving. And so that's another story. Do you have any advice for people who are experiencing disc-related symptoms or injuries? It is a holistic process. No one will fix you. You need to be willing to show up and uh, participate in your own rescue, as it were. You need to be willing to do that. If it's all about your pain, my pain, my pain, my pain, over and over, then your ego is, is heavily invested in that. So do some exploration on what all, all of that means. Because using my example, I was heavily invested in my I my ego as a mountain guide and i'm invincible and i'm i've got endless energy and boundless energy I can carry a pack for 24 hours i can carry two packs whatever it is i've got this i've built up this image of myself that i want to portray to everyone and it's mm. crumbling have a look at the ego and see how that's affecting the pain mm. because pain is so relevant to the mood you're in yeah when the mood is wrong the pain will be worse when the yeah. mood is right. And my shoulder is a perfect example. Things were going right in my life. I had this shoulder injury. And so many people said, this will be the most painful um, six weeks of your life. Within 24 hours, 48, call it 48 hours, um, I had overcome. There was no pain. Um, I was sorry I didn't take any painkillers when I left the hospital because I didn't sleep the first night. So you night. had surgery for a rotator cuff tear in your shoulder. Rotator cuff tear, which is, I had this bone ache for maybe a week, but it wasn't painful. It was just, I was aware of this bone ache when so many people I, I, I met said, oh, you'll, you'll just, you won't be able to do anything for six weeks. Mm. Maybe that was because I'd experienced worse pain before. Mm. I don't know, but I, I tend to feel it was more about me having an awareness that um, this is not going to end my life. Yeah. That it doesn't matter what this brings, so I'll be able to deal with it. So there was some resilience there, and um, it, and and if and if it did change my life and I wasn't able to climb anymore, that's okay. I'd be ready to accept that. Yeah, you learnt the surrender process with your previous injury. Yeah. Mm, okay. Um, probably what I want to impart with disc injuries is that it is a huge emotional roller coaster. And you will get through it. However, it does involve you surrendering and getting the right support and accountability to making these changes in your life. Um, but also getting the right advice because there are times where you may actually need to get surgery. However, I always say to people with disc injuries is make sure you look at the circumstances under which that injury happened because you've got other discs around. They don't always take all the disc out. So you can still re-injure it if you don't change habits, be it physical or emotional. All right. Thanks heaps for sharing your neck and your disc injury. That's probably the most significant one where you had a massive turning point in your life and change in situations. Can you just touch a little bit on your knee injuries that happened a few years later because you had quite a bit of insight and awareness by, by that point? Well, the 
the first knee injury was 2003 and the second one was 2013. So they were 10 years apart. The 2003 was the right, right side and 2013 was the left side. And they were both the same thing, medial meniscus tear. And um, particularly with the second one, I had this awareness that I was doing something I didn't want to do. It wasn't particularly difficult. Uh, it wasn't a hard day in the mountains. It was very easy guiding, but I had my schedule. And at the last moment, my schedule changed because someone else got sick. And so my boss came asking for a favor and please do this three day trip. It's very easy. And I said, well, I don't really want to because it's going to mess my schedule up. And the schedule of having a break. The schedule of having a break, exactly. And and I, I gave in because it was an easy job. It, it is what you would call an easy job, but it was still working. So I went in and, and on day two, at the start of the day, it was a beautiful day. It wasn't cold. And we, we left the hut within half an hour, 45 minutes. I just felt this tear. I felt the, I heard a pop and I felt something go or give way. And you didn't fall or? I didn't fall. I was just stepping, just mm. stepping. It wasn't even a big step. Um, but uh, because I'd experienced it before, I had a pretty good idea of what it was. And, and the sensation was that my knee had dislocated. It wasn't a dislocation. That was just the sensation or how I would describe it. And effectively, the, the meniscus had torn and flipped over and created a bit of a gap. It, it was irregular, whatever was going on there. My clients caught up and said, oh, are we having a break here? And I laughed and I said, yeah, we're having a break here. Let me explain what's going on. I'm pretty sure I've torn something in my knee and I'm just going to try to get it back in place. And I, I stretched my knee out and it audibly, it was an audible pop as it went back in um, after what I call a dislocation. Definitely, it wasn't a dislocation. It was just <laughs> how I sort of described it. It felt really weird, like the leg wasn't tracking properly. And, um, yeah, so the, I explained that to f some people and, and, and how this was my state of mind. And I found that that was important for me to recognize that I had gained this understanding through the psychosomatic therapy, um, of, of where these injuries find themselves. And there is no reason to believe that the mechanics of that injury were brought about by a big step with a heavy pack or the cold or other factors or, or a big day. It wasn't any of those things. It was very easy guiding. It was very easy trekking or tramping in the hills before, you know, the, the, um, there wasn't really any hard out mountaineering going on at all in that trip. So I was just a little bit amazed that this had happened. Uh, and the, and the logic for me was that, I didn't want to be there. I was hoping to get through this trip so I could get back on track with what was already rusted for me. And I was doing this as a favor, but I just, I wasn't really present and I wanted to get through it as quickly as possible. Mm. And the knees, I talk about them being linked with your solar plexus, which is identity, confidence, self-esteem, trust in yourself, and ego comes in there, power as well. And the left knee... I often actually relate that to relationships. That's when we were in a relationship, though, so <laughs> I don't know what that means. Well, we we had we had gotten married about six six weeks prior. Oh, okay, yeah, interesting. Yeah, and we were living apart. We were doing the long distance relationship thing, pretty much from the get go. And left side, which we haven't gone into, has a lot to do with intuition, emotional expression, and creativity. And the knees, so the right knee, sorry, because Gav had right knee issues as well. Right, um, masculine is about driven and a lot more around career. So it's about how flexible you are moving forwards, feeling like you're going in the right direction. Yeah. Can you relate to that? Yeah. The um, the the injuries that I was ha ha um, the injuries that were occurring on the left hand side now weren't necessarily, particularly with the shoulder weren't necessarily from that moment, the left knee, I believe, was, uh, but it was more a culmination of um, the lack of ex my ability to express myself on, on that more uh, intuitive level. 
um, I was beginning to exercise that muscle, the muscle of um, emotional uh, expression, um, but I hadn't developed it fully. I was, you know, I'm still working on it, of course. Mm. Um, and it was showing up at, at the base of my uh, um, arm, which is an expressor on the left hand side. Um, that makes sense to me. And the left knee, of course, was um, about being stuck or, or being asked or forced at an extreme level to do something I don't want to do. And not following your gut, which was to rest. To rest. And this is a very common thing in army people. Knees are a really, really mm. common thing in army people because their identity is taken away from them. The identi identity is is in the knees and obviously the left hand side is the emotional side i don't get to express myself the way i want to someone else is having taking some control of that for me and i'm doing something against my will what happens mm. in the army you get no emotional expression you have your identity um dictated to you dictated to you yeah it's completely like given this new identity and you must behave the only thing that distinguishes you from the next soldier is your name tag so uh, uh and of course i can't think of anything worse mm. than something like that so yeah. it was playing out in my knee yeah and what's interesting more on the physical level and again just reaching that diagnosis was you did that early on in the year i was living in brisbane you were back in new zealand and you knew you had done something wrong and you went to see the doctor and this is where i talk a lot about you know, trust your gut that something has happened and the need to advocate for yourself to get things investigated further. So you went to the doctor and they said, let's just leave it for six weeks. And you had called me and told me what had happened to your knee. And just from the description, I could tell that something worse was going on. Plus knowing your personality, you're not someone to exaggerate injuries or um, play into injuries. And I couldn't believe that the doctor would say to you, let's just leave this for six weeks. It just sounded like they were working by a protocol and you had a big trip planned in a few months time in June to go to Peru. And so not having someone put that picture together was crazy. And I love to look outside the box to get solutions for people. And that meant getting an MRI to find out what was going on in the knee because it was significantly locking and you had already started getting muscle wasting as well. And it ended up being that Gavin would fly back to Brisbane. He flew, flew, he only just left and did his knee injury. So he flew back to Brisbane, got an MRI, uh, which was only a couple of hundred dollars over there, found out it was a complex tear. And then thankfully we had some contacts in Wanaka, a great physio who had a look at him and referred him straight away to a specialist. And I think it was within a few weeks you actually had the operation. Mm. Um, and bizarre, when I saw his knee when he came back to Brisbane, was you could actually see this piece of meniscus come out of his knee. Like I always criticise people when they say, oh, that thing, you know, moved out of place. But he literally had something pop out of his knee. It was like this little alien and you could relocate it back inside Stick, his knee. Sticking out the side. Yeah. So I just think when you've got something like that, it's clearly not something that you just leave for six weeks and taking into consideration someone's physicality and their job um, is something that needs to be considered. So if you're not happy with the first opinion you get, ask around and um, get the right support. Yeah, I'd, I'd taken the conservative approach when the first knee meniscus tore in 2003 and spent nine or 10 months going through this process of physiotherapy and rehabilitation and so on and so on. And I still, it still just kept popping out that dislocation that I called. Um, it's, and, and so the other one was presenting the same way and it would, every couple of days it would pop out again when I was most relaxed, when the muscles just eased off and I was in a very relaxed position. And, um, and so I was motivated to not, be conservative this time and just let it heal. And that may have been a bad decision, but my gut was telling me I could waste nine or 10 months on this again. I'm motivated to make this, um, to, to, to not to fix this straight away, but to find out what it is straight away. And the doctor wouldn't 
give me any direction towards an MRI scan without sitting on it for six weeks and conservatively managing it. And I thought, well, this is the greatest waste of, of time. Mm. And it would have cost you more in the end to wait. Yeah, I, and I had I had this conversation with many different people, many different um, um, uh, departments, you know, when trying to work through how I, I, I couldn't work. Um, so obviously that was going to cost me from a... Um, um, from the perspective of not having an income again mm -hmm. and so i was motivated to be fit and ready for that trip which was actually in july in peru and i i could if i waited six weeks then it wouldn't it was unlikely to happen and if i didn't wait and get something done straight away then it was more likely to uh, be able to go through the process of having the the minor surgery the arthroscopy is a minor surgery and um, have the torn piece taken out, debrided, mm. and then um, I would be back on my feet the same day and, and I would be able to guide. And, and that's what eventually happened. Mm. And it was, um, it was about government funding or not. Um, the, because the doctor said, no, wait for six weeks, I didn't have any support from ACC, the, the process here in New Zealand, and they wouldn't cover an MRI so I said, well, it, I'll, I'll take the matter into my own hands. I'll go and get an MRI. We discovered together through conversing with Jin, an MRI in New Zealand at the time cost $1,000 and it cost 120 in Brisbane. So I could fly a to... A hundred. Come on. Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> but, but it was cheaper to fly to it Brisbane cheaper. and get the MRI. <laughs> I had change in my pocket after flying back to Brisbane, having an MRI and uh, coming back here again. And I had something to present to the specialist and I, I moved things forward and I probably saved three months mm. um, of, of waiting. Yeah. And, and the MRI proved that it was a tear. And we, we tried other treatments while I was in Brisbane and, it, and, and some of those treatments were, were, were made my knee feel fantastic. Um, what were they called? Skena, but it was, just, it was temporary though. It was temporary and, and it, it proved the point that this wasn't going to, heal. well, this was highly unlikely to heal itself anytime soon so and it, after that scanner i think a day or two after that scanner i remember waking you up because i was so relaxed lying in bed one night i turned over and it popped again and i said have a look at this here's the here's what i'm talking about this dog this dislocation you feel that thing sticking out the side and that's what jim is referring to mm. great okay so is there anything else you would like to share with us about your guiding about any perspective around injuries? Um, bring awareness to the other aspect of your injury, not just the physical mm -hmm. side, but what was your state of mind at the time of the injury or what were the events leading up to it? What yep. was your physical, mental, emotional and spiritual situation? If you can understand that or gain some insight, you'll, you will be dealing with it holistically. Mm. And would you say that you're living the life that you want to now? Absolutely. So I've been injury free for six or more years, seven. Um, I think the last operation was 2013. Um, and I feel free now to express myself and that people will show up to this, you know, unique thing that I've developed. And uh, it feels like I'm on track. I'm on purpose. I'm mm. on the right bus with the right person driving, going in the right direction. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I just want to wrap up with six questions so people can be inspired and take action on a few things. So just a quick one sentence answer um, to elaborate. What are you grateful for? I'm grateful to wake up in paradise every day. Where's paradise? Well, paradise currently, Wanaka, the place I want to live. And uh, I enjoy waking up amongst the mountains every mm -hmm. day. Great. What's your favorite book? Um, favorite book is a very hard one, but I'll tell you what I'm currently reading. And that's a book called Your Brain on Nature. Um, exactly the kind of book I, I need to read right now. Yeah. Great. And do you have a movie recommendation? Oh, very hard. Um, the last movie I saw in the cinema was 1917, and I thoroughly recommend that, particularly in the movie, in the theatre. 
when they can get there. <laughs> of course. I, I don't know if it's I don't know if it's on Netflix. I doubt if it's on Netflix yet. <laughs> uh, who's an inspirational person to you and why? Oh, uh, Goenka. S.N. Goenka, who was the modern teacher of uh, Vipassana meditation. Um, he died in 2013, I think it was. While we were doing a Vipassana course. During a course that we were doing, yeah. Yeah. S.N. Goenka. Cool. And something you think everyone should try. Ooh. That everyone should try mountaineering. <laughs> no matter how scared you are, everyone should give it a go. Cool. What belief do you think people should embrace to live a more fulfilled life? Embrace change. Embrace change. Just like the world we're living in right now, this enforced lockdown, embrace that. Mm -hmm. Find the novelty in it. Find the learning in it. And you can apply that to injuries, illness, disease, whatever. Um, embrace the change. Find out what it is that you need to know about yourself. Yeah, definitely. And we're just getting a, a good dose of that at the moment is to adapt and change. Great. And if anyone wants to find you, how can they get in touch with you, have a look at what you're up to? Well, my I've got two websites. One is firstlightguiding.com, firstlightguiding.com, and the other is gavinlangphotography.com. And I, I do, there is a little bit of cross-pollination between those platforms because I take photographs for the guiding. Um, but the, the, the courses I run, self-mastery through mountaineering, you'll find through firstlightguiding.com. Mm -hmm. And I'll pop these links in the notes. What about social media? Social media on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Uh, I think all the handles are just, just slightly different. Uh, <laughs> um, First Light Guiding is quite long and it doesn't fit into all those social media platforms. All right, we'll post them later then. Okay. Okay, great. Thanks so much for being my first Pain Story guest. You're welcome. It was an honour. Cool. All right, thanks everyone for listening and we will have a new Pain Story for you soon. Bye. Thank you for tuning in to the Art of Listening to Your Body podcast. Anything shared during this episode is for information only. It does not replace professional advice from a healthcare practitioner. If you are experiencing pain, injury or illness, seek advice that is catered to your individual needs. Thank you for listening to this podcast. If you enjoyed it and want to hear more, please subscribe and share this with your friends. You can find me on Facebook and Instagram. My handle is The Art of Listening to Your Body. If you're interested in getting started with a foundational exercise, head to my website, planningpowerhouse.com and grab your free core values worksheet.